Debbie and I uh, got back from uh, London uh, last evening. Long flight, uh, but a wonderful trip. It was kind of a, well, it was a family reunion. And we went to Wimbledon, watched some tennis. We um, also ate at a really cool Indian restaurant. London supposedly has the best Indian restaurants. And uh, this was a restaurant called Gymkhana. And uh, I think best Indian food we both tasted. Debbie's nodding her head in, in agreement. And it was really fun to see my brother and my sister. I haven't seen them since before COVID. In fact, the last time I went to India, 2019, when my mom died, of course, that was also brief and it was, it was a, a, that occasion. So it was nice after all this time to, um, to have some time to really just we'll walk around, catch up and do some fun stuff um, together. And um, now I'm just getting caught up on all the stuff that's been going on. And I want to start today by talking about uh, the um, important development in the Missouri versus Biden case. So to bring you up to speed, this is the case filed by the Attorneys General of Missouri uh, and Louisiana against the Biden administration for um, collaborating with social media platforms to do systematic censorship, not only on COVID, but also on election fraud and a whole bunch of other issues. What I want to talk about is that the a federal judge in Louisiana has essentially outlawed, forbidden the Biden administration from communicating with the social media platforms on a wide series of topics. In other words, you've got to stop this censorship collaboration and you've got to stop it now. Now, the New York Times is very upset about this. They say, quote, a ruling that could curtail efforts to combat false and misleading narratives about the coronavirus pandemic and other issues. We can write this off as gobbledygook because the question is, these aren't false or misleading narratives. They're false or misleading narratives, according to Biden and according to The New York Times. But that's only because they contradict the premises of the left. In many cases, what is being censored is true information. And in fact, this is even admitted when they start talking about malinformation. Malinformation is information that is true, but somehow, quote, harmful. The word mal just means bad. Now, uh, what's going on here is this case, this is a big case and it's not going to be resolved immediately. The, the litigation is pending, but uh, Louisiana and, um, and um, Missouri asked the judge to issue a temporary injunction. So a temporary injunction means I'm going to issue an order now based upon the likelihood that Missouri and Louisiana will win this case. The judge has to make a determination in advance or at the early stages based upon existing uh, filings and existing discovery. I think these guys are likely to prevail. And so I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and stop the censorship sort of preemptively or while it's going on, and then the case can proceed. Obviously, if the outcome comes out differently, uh, we can make a different decision at that point. So this means that uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube can no longer have these portals where government agencies like the FBI, the Department of Health and Human Services, the White House are feeding in suspend this guy, deplatform that guy, remove this kind of content, all of that has to stop. Now, the judge did say um, that um, this is Judge Terry Doty of the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Louisiana. He said, look, government agencies can still notify social media platforms about what? Post detailing crimes, uh, posts that have to do with national security threats, or foreign attempts to influence elections. So that's allowed. But the rest of it, the idea of censoring US citizens, that has that has got to that has got to stop. And not only is the is the government forbidden from interacting with the social media platforms directly, it can't even use intermediaries. Let's remember that this censorship has often occurred by surrogates. And so if the government wants to do something, they don't do it directly. They go to the Election Integrity Partnership, the so-called EIP, or the Virality Project, or the Stanford Internet Observatory, and they say, listen, these are all the guys we want kicked off. And then the Stanford Internet Observatory passes that along 
along to Twitter or that along to YouTube, and they obligingly knock those people off uh, or knock most of those people off. And so the government is able to sort of disguise its participation in the censorship industry by sort of officially staying out of it and using these intermediaries. Well, the judge goes, no, can't do that either. No, using these intermediaries, you've got to stop. So this is actually a very significant victory for free speech. No wonder the New York Times is, you know, having some fainting spells over it. Quote, federal judge limits Biden officials contacts with social media sites. But what this means is that free speech is not a lost cause. Obviously, Elon Musk showed that one way to save free speech is to buy Twitter, $44 billion price tab, and then liberate it, so to speak. So Twitter is now largely a free speech platform. But the other way to do it is this way, which is to say, and I'm, it's very good to see these, these attorney generals taking the front lines. I mean, there are so many Republican attorneys general, and many of them don't do a whole lot. So we do want to congratulate Louisiana and Missouri for taking the lead in this. I think this is this could very well be the most important First Amendment case in decades. It certainly is the for most important First Amendment case so far of the 21st century. Huge implications affects not just Trump, not just not just uh, certain prominent people, but affects you and me.